So I'm going to send you across to Brent so that he can greet them. Well, hello and welcome to everyone who's just joining us. And, oh, the lions growling at each other. And a big welcome to all our schools today. Uh, we've had a really exciting afternoon so far. Um, my name is Brent Theo Smith. I have Archie on camera. And uh, we managed to follow these lions hunting the buffalo a little bit earlier. They managed to bring down a big, probably about 800 kilogram, so over 1,600 pound buffalo bull. And it was very, very traumatic and exciting at the same time to watch this hunt or and, or unfold. And uh, now the lions are busy getting down to the nitty-gritty of eating their hard-earned catch. One of the lionesses got wounded. She took a horn um, into the skin next to her throat. Uh, it doesn't look too bad. It looks it looks quite quite bad from, from our point of view at the moment, but it looks like just a flesh wound. But uh, let's just move around a little bit so we can see what the lions are up to. So they managed to bring down this buffalo in some very long grass. So there are, there's one adult male, let's have a quick look here, there's one adult male, three lionesses and two young males, and uh, there they all are, munching on their buffalo. Now for our schools, I can't wait to hear all your questions about Africa and what's going on, but in the meantime, let's go send you across to the tallest mammal in Africa. I have got lots of the tallest mammals of Africa to show you, but I do want to quickly say hello to the students who have joined us this afternoon. It's wonderful to have you on board. I promise we're going to look more at the giraffe in a moment, but I just want to quickly introduce myself. My name is Jamie, and this afternoon, Adrian is on camera with me. In other words, Adrian is the person who's actually bringing you these amazing images. I just talk about them and drive the car. So we are sitting with a herd of a Maasai giraffe and that is a different species that is the species that occurs here in this part of Kenya in the Maasai Mara and what we've got is a really big male he's the guy walking at the back and he's walking to a group of females now the question for all of you is how many of you know what you call a herd of giraffe what is the collective noun for giraffe. It's one of my favorite, favorite words, so I want to see if you can maybe guess what it is. Now, Blake, you want to know what is the tallest giraffe. Now, of course, all giraffe are very, very tall. Um, they can reach up to, around, well, they're on average around about five meters. But the Maasai giraffe is actually the tallest species of giraffe and the biggest of all of them. The, the record-breaking giraffe was a giraffe called George. And George was from Kenya and George was 20 feet high. Now what I want you to do once we're finished with the safari is I want you to measure out on the floor 20 feet and work out exactly how big that is. So mark off where George's feet would have been and mark off where the top of George's head would have been and then You've all got to lie down and see how many of you it takes to reach all the way up to 20 feet. So that's over six meters. That is absolutely massive. But George was a Maasai giraffe just like these ones. And of course, he would have been a giraffe that everybody knew the height of because he actually lived in a zoo. Whereas we don't really go up to these giraffe and measure them. So we don't know if there's e an even taller giraffe somewhere out here in the wild. Now that male at the back, he will be much, much taller than the females. 
Now, Elizabeth, when you look at a giraffe, you think that a giraffe might actually be quite a slow animal. Slow animal. And that's actually, when you see them run, they look like they're moving really, really slowly. But they're not, because their legs are so long that they can run up to 60 kilometers an hour. So that's, to give you an idea of how fast that is, that's probably about as fast as your parents are driving, not on the motorway or on a highway, but are driving on sort of some of the streets streets, the bigger streets around where you live. So 60 kilometers an hour, that is, let's say you're really fast. Maybe you are the fastest in your class. If you ran at your absolute fastest, you'd still have to run, mm, I would say, three times faster than that to be as fast as a giraffe. And a giraffe is not like a horse. It can't trot. It either walks or it runs. That's all it can do. It can either walk or run. And their legs are so long that they cover ground very, very quickly. Ah, now here's an interesting story, Luke. Now Luke is wondering about how long a baby giraffe's neck is. Now, when a baby giraffe is first born, here's why I say it's so interesting. It doesn't look exactly like the adults. And that's because it needs to have, remember how we said they run fast? Its legs need to be long enough that it can keep up with its mother and run away from predators, but it still needs to be able to drink milk from its mother. And what that means is that baby giraffe actually have quite short necks. They look, they look odd. They look disproportionate. So it doesn't quite look like a normal giraffe or a, a giraffe, but smaller. They've got quite short necks and probably the longest that a baby giraffe's neck would be would be just over a meter or just over three feet. Maybe up to, maybe, okay, let's say up to about four feet or five feet. So their necks look very strange. But a baby giraffe, remember, is actually quite a big animal. Okay, so we have enjoyed this peaceful scene with these giraffe. I'm going to go and search for other animals to show you. So while I go off in search of other animals, let's go back across to Brent so that you can spend some more time with the lions. Look at that. There's a big, beautiful male lion in his prime, probably around seven years old, six or seven years old. You know, he might cause a bit of a fight if he wants to get in there. He might chase the smaller lions, male lions, and the female lions out of the way because he is so much bigger and so much stronger than them. Or he might be in a good mood today. We're going to find out shortly. Or we can hear a bit of growling starting. He's big, he just moves his way in there. And the others will normally move out of his way and if they don't, he'll swat them. Jaslyn is wondering why do animals eat other animals. Well, that's what they're designed to do. A buffalo is natural prey for the lions. And think about human beings. Human beings eat other animals too. We eat cows, we eat deer, antelope, chickens, birds. So it is nature. And in nature, animals eat other animals. Now, if the lions didn't eat this buffalo, they wouldn't survive. Daphne would like to know how much meat can a male lion eat? Well, in a single sitting, uh, a male lion can eat up to about 15 kilograms, 12 to 15 kilograms, so over 30 pounds. And then what happens is he'll go lie with his big fat tummy somewhere and he'll sleep. And they've got a very fast digestive system, so they become hungry again quite quickly. So once he's finished eating for a bit, he'll lie down for an hour or two and then he'll start eating again. Ella
Ella is wondering why do lions hunt animals that are bigger than them? Well, Ella, because they are, um, as I said, they are. Well, how many lions we got here? Two, fe three females, two young males. So we got six lions. So a small animal that's smaller than the, than the lions wouldn't be able to feed all of these lions. But a big buffalo like this will feed all of them for the next two or three days. Chloe is wondering how long are a lion's teeth? Uh, well, a big incisor um, will be probably two inches, two and a half inches on outside of the the gum. Uh, so that can be up, up to two, so probably around two inches on average. And that's only the big, long, sorry, canine teeth, not the incisors. The incisors are quite a lot smaller. Samurai would like to know what else lions eat. Uh, all sorts, they'll eat giraffe, zebra, wildebeest, buffalo, impala, warthog, uh, hippo, Ooh, what else am I forgetting? Topi, hartebeest, uh, I think I know, whatever they can. Whatever they can catch, they'll eat. Um, even sometimes if it's quite small, um, there'll be a big fight over it, but whatever meat is available, they will eat as quickly as possible. And quite often when it's something small, they'll eat much faster because they don't want to share with the other lions. Oh, they've cut the big male out again. He's trying to step in. No, he's not that interested. So while we wait here to see what happens next, Jamie's got an animal that the lions don't eat very often. Oh, it's a little bit big for the lions to try and hunt elephants. They can, but it's unusual for them to try and do that because it would be very, very dangerous for them. Now, you might think that a baby elephant, like the little one that's wandering around there, you might think that perhaps that would be a good size snack for a lion, but it's absolutely not because it has a whole load of five, six ton protectors. So what I mean by that is that that the female elephants, probably one of them would weigh about four times the size of this car, four times the weight of this car. Uh, they are they are more than capable of protecting their little ones. Now, I love elephants, and I think that most of you have joined us on a safari before. Now, you know how much I love spending time with elephants, and there's a lot of different reasons for that. One is that they are always, look at this one on the right here, little one. They are always doing something entertaining, like this one that is uh, trying to kneel down in the grass, or was. And they are also very, very intelligent animals. Now, Anna Jar, looking at a big elephant like these ones, you want to know how much do they eat. Anna Jar, a big adult elephant, could eat around about between 200 and 300 kilograms of food in one day. So that is around about 500 to 600 odd pounds of food. Let's think how much that would have to be. That's probably more food than you would eat, certainly in a month, almost, possibly even longer than that. I'm trying to think how much food we eat. Definitely a lot less than an elephant. And that is every single day. That is a lot of food. Our grocery bills would be exorbitant if we had to eat as much as an elephant eats. But that's why it's a good thing that elephants are herbivores because it means that although they eat lots and lots of grass and sometimes leaves and trees and fruit, even though they eat lots of it, there's still lots more. So an elephant wouldn't poss couldn't possibly eat all of the food that's around here. And this is a very little elephant, so it's definitely not going to eat all of that food. Right, so 
we see lots of similar creatures both here in Kenya and in South Africa. So what we're going to do is we're going to send you all the way across to a different part of the African continent to look at an elephant with Scott. Hello everyone and a special welcome to the three schools, Providence, Lincoln and Three Oaks Elementaries who are joining us for their first time. And my name's Scott and I'm teamed up with VM on camera. As you can see we've got an elephant, just a big lone bull who's snoozing in the midday sun. It's still very, very hot and he is just taking it easy. And a good sign of that is the way he's resting his trunk over his tusk. Elephants like to do that when they're relaxing, especially the big old boys like this guy. And you guys will notice that the area here is quite different to where you were with Brent and Jamie. We are in a different country, right at the bottom tip of Africa, and there's lots of bushes here. So it makes our lives a little bit more difficult to find animals than it is up in the mire because there's more places for them to hide. But I like that. It's quite exciting not knowing even where big animals like this could be. We only saw them when we were very, very close. So... He's relaxing under a marula tree and I am guessing that he's been feeding on the fruits from this tree before he decided to have a snooze. It is one of their favorite food, the fruits of this tree, and they are in full fruit at the moment. Now we came into this area initially because we had some tracks of a young male leopard and I'm hoping that we're going to get lucky and find you the spotted cat a little bit later. You've been lucky already with Jamie and Brent up in the mire with lions and giraffe and some elephants there. And I'm hoping we're going to be able to find you a leopard a little bit later. Alex, you would like to know how long do elephants' tusks get? Well, it all depends on the individual elephants. There's no set sizes. And just like in your class, you'll have some people that are big and some people that are small. And everyone's a slightly different shape and design. The same is for the elephants and their tusks. This guy's got beautiful tusks, but they're not very long. Some elephants' tusks are so long that they touch the ground when the elephant's walking and they have to hold their head up high. And if an elephant like that was needing to take a snooze, now, oh, he just blew some cool dust up all over his body, probably to chase some flies off. And Matilda and Tyson, you guys would like to know how long do elephants live? And it's a similar answer to, oh, some more dust, similar uh, answer to the tusks of the elephants. It all depends on the individual. But interestingly, elephants do live for quite a long time, longer than most of the animals that live out here in Africa, and they can live up to around 60 years, which is very long for a wild animal. And if you think that a lion will only live for about 10 to 15 years at the most, it gives you an idea of how much longer an elephant lives than some other animals out here. This big old guy, I'm guessing, could be somewhere around maybe 35 years old. He's not too old, but it is just guesswork. We don't know exactly how old he is. Salome, you'd like to know why do elephants always travel together? And I guess you sent that question through when you were still with Jamie up in Kenya, because as you would have noticed here, this guy's all alone. And a lot of the time animals will move together for safety and friendship. So it's a combination of things. Um, the elephant uh, boys, like this one, they don't necessarily follow the herds. It's just the ladies with their kids and their girlfriends that stick together. And they do that, like I say, I guess, for comfort and security. They've got lots of young calves. And even though elephants are very big, they can still be be eaten by lions so by sticking together it increases their safety and even the boys like this one sometimes move together with a few other boys not as big of a herd as with the girls and it's probably just for you know somebody to talk to somebody to spend their time with but there's no set rules out here in mother nature and even though there is kind of general behavior that we get to see the animals doing it does vary, 
and I like to always think about us as humans when asking and answering questions about animals because even us humans are all different. Some of us like certain sweets and others like vegetables and other people like other things. Some people like pizza, some people don't. And it's the same with wild animals. They all have their own individual personality. Now, some of you would like to know, how is it that elephants defend themselves? Well, being the largest animal out here in Africa, they use their size and their tusks to create any kind of dominance that they need to in chasing off other animals. And usually not many animals get in the way of elephants because, of course, they are just so much bigger than most other animals. Hippos are, you know, big hippos, half the size of an elephant, and that's probably the next biggest animal after the elephants. But they will use their tusks, they'll use their trunks, they'll use their feet, and they can be very, very aggressive when they want to be. So even though he's nice and sleepy now, oh, is he going to shake the tree for us? I think we're going to get lucky. He's going to listen carefully. Is he just scratching his nose? I was hoping he was going to try and shake the fruits off this tree. But it looks like he may just have something that he would like to scratch. Does he have a little bit of a wound on his trunk there? I wonder if he's got a little wound on his trunk. I can't... Yeah, he does. Oh, shame. He's got a bit of an injury on his trunk, and I wonder what that's from. Maybe fighting with another elephant bull. Maybe his trunk got pinched between his tusks and the elephant's and his opponent's tusk as well. How bizarre is this, him risking his tusk up like that? I wonder if it's helping to soothe the pain of that injury. It doesn't look too bad. And wild animals are far tougher than we are when it comes to recovering from injuries. They don't have any doctors or special cream that they can put onto their wounds. And he's also throwing dust onto it to try and keep the flies away. So that's exactly what's going on there. Fascinating. So that's his special <laughs> medicine to keep the flies away. Shame, and now he's giving himself a big old scratch and the whole tree shaking while he does that. Imagine being so big and powerful that you could shake a tree this big. Okay, very good. We're going to spend a little bit longer with this relaxed big old boy and send you all the way back up to Kenya. It's 1,600 miles away from here, so it'll take you the best part of a day to drive there, a full day to drive there, if the roads were good, which they are not. Anyway, over to Brent. Well, thanks, Scotty D. So some of the lions have decided it's time for a bit of rest rather than eating. So uh, those young boys gorge themselves quite quickly. I, I think it won't be too long till they're on the on the munch again. But there's still one young boy, that lioness who picked up the injury during the hunt, and uh, and the big boy are still munching away. There we go. You can see that injury now that it stopped bleeding. It's not looking nearly as serious as it was a little while ago. As I said, it looks like more of a flesh wound than anything else. Gabriel is wondering, do I ever have to worry about a lion hurting me in the car? No, I don't, Gabriel. Um, the lions don't see the car as a natural threat. Um, they don't actually see the people in the car uh, where we're sitting. So, but they see there's a big sort of smelly thing that smells like diesel. What's behind us there? No, nothing I saw. Uh, one of the lions walked off, I think, to go have a drink. So I'm wondering when it's going to come back. One of the, the little boys... Oh no, he's back. He must have snuck back in. Uh, but so no, we're not we're not in danger here. And uh, as also you've got to, if the only way to become in danger here is if I was to sort of try chase the lions away from their meal or, or drive too close to them. So I'm keeping a respectful distance. Oh, you can see that wound on that lioness now um, as she's feeding. So that happened during this hunt. There's another lioness getting up as well.
Brady is wondering, what is a lion's predator? Uh, Brady, the biggest killer of lions outside of human beings is other lions. So lions will fight amongst each other. So these little boys that we're looking at there now, uh, when in about probably in about a year's time, that big male there will chase them away. And, and as they move through different areas while they grow up and get bigger and try to find their own place, the, the other 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 lions will try kill them as they move. So the biggest threat to lions is other lions. Occasionally hyenas will kill an injured lion, but unusual that lion will have to be sick or injured for hyenas to to actually be able to kill them. But lion cubs have a lot of predators when they are left alone when the females go out to try go hunting uh, snakes uh, martial eagles buffalo will kill lion cubs uh, other lions leopards hyenas will all kill little cubs if given the opportunity oh there's the big boy he might go have a little snooze or is he just trying to find a new spot to feed on this buffalo Three Oaks Elementary are wondering, can lions hunt at night time? Well, Three Oaks, they actually prefer hunting at night. This pride was very, very hungry today, and so they were hunting during the day. All, all of the big cats are opportunistic, uh, opportunistic, so they'll hunt day or night, but normally lions hunt more at night than during the day, and their nighttime vision is about eight times better than ours. Isn't that incredible? So they can actually see quite a lot in the dark where we can't. Now, as I said, this time of the year, the lions are normally hunting something not nearly as big as this. But Jamie's found some of them, and hopefully for those little creatures, the lions aren't around. We have, um, but more importantly, it's not just about going on safari to see the big animals like lions and elephants, although they're wonderful to see. We also like to stop and look at some of the smaller animals. Now, this particular type of animal is called a warthog, and it's basically a kind of pig. And you could just see their ears sticking up out of the grass. Now, warthog do something very special because they like to forage about in these areas where the grass is long. Now, it's difficult for little ones like the ones that we saw to to actually follow behind the adults when they're running away. So what the adults do is they stick their tails up in the air, just like that, there we go, so that the little piglets can follow them through the long grass without getting lost and without finding themselves somewhere dangerous. So that is why warthogs stick their tails up when they run, because most of the time they're running through really, really long grass, and they need, it's basically like a little flag that the warthog is waving up above its bottom. There you go, see the little piglets catching up with their mother? So that's how they follow behind her. Trot, 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 off she goes, and then the little piglets will follow along behind and they won't lose the adults in the long grass. And that's important out here because you never know when there might be a lion hiding in the grass somewhere around here. Oh, lions are pretty good at hiding away, and there's actually quite a few animals that are very good at hiding in long grass. There is one animal that is not so good at hiding unless the trees are very, very thick, and that is an elephant. So let us head across and f see some more elephants with a Tristan in South Africa. Well, what an exciting afternoon it's been so far, and we've got more big elephants to show you. So Scott had one, and we have now got a whole big grouping together, which is all very, very exciting. Now, my name is Tristan, and on camera today I've got a Senzo. There's his three fingers as normal. So I hope so far that you're enjoying things, and remember that you must ask lots and lots of questions. So tell your teacher, and she'll send them all through to us. Now, these elephants that are here, you can see that they are very dark in coloration. They almost look like they're black. And the reason why that is is because they have just come from a swim. 
they went to a water hole that's not too far away and they would have sprayed themselves with water and they would have gone inside to try and cool themselves down. You can see that it is a sunny, bright day out here and it is quite hot in the sun, which means that these elephants, unfortunately, because they're so big, they get very warm very, very quickly. And so what's happening is that they have gone and swam and now they've come out and they are starting to flap their ears a lot. And that's because they're all just trying to help with this cooling process. The more they flap their ears, the cooler they're going to get. And the reason why why is that there is a few veins that sit on the back or blood vessels that sit on the back of the ears and those blood vessels carry all the blood for the elephant around its body and so when they flap their ears they're pulling wind over those blood vessels and they cool that blood down and they make it a situation where it's kind of is like an air con or an air conditioning unit for the elephant and it helps to keep the blood nice and cool so it's a very important thing for an elephant to have they need to have those ears that big to help cope with the African Sun when they wet them it just makes it that much easier to cool down now Rihanna you wondering if any animals eat elephants well yes there are a few animals that will eat elephants so Brent's lions up in the Mara those animals would be capable of taking a elephant but it's very dangerous for any animal to hunt elephants so you find that even though the lions can grab them they try not to because there's much easier things to hunt like buffalo they can be much safer hunting those than these big elephants and so when they do hunt elephants if they have to it's normally because they can't find any other food and if they find a sick young elephant then they go after them the other animals that will go after elephants is hyenas and then sometimes if there's a really small baby elephant that's struggling to stand a little bit then a leopard might go after them as well so Logan you're wondering how do elephants sleep and for how long well Logan most of the time elephants can sleep standing up so they'll just kind of walk up to a tree put their head against a tree and just have a little rest the little baby ones like this young elephant that you see here they'll sometimes lie down and sleep on their side like we would lie down and sleep and they normally sleep for short periods of time it's normally sort of 15 to 20 minutes that they'll sleep for and then they're up and moving and then again for 15 20 minutes and so that's how they kind of go is they're just short little spells of sleeping as they try and kind of rest throughout the day but they don't sleep for very long like us they don't sleep like we do for you know an eight hour period they'll have short little periods that they sleep then they go feed and go and drink and then they'll sleep again and then feed and drink and sleep and so it just kind of rolls through Sophia, you're wondering how long an elephant's trunk is. Well, the elephant's trunk on a fully grown male can get as long as seven feet. So that's very tall. It's very, very big. It's much bigger than what I am if I'm standing up. And so it's very long. And it's so useful because the elephant, you can see its mouth is far from the ground. And so because it eats grasses and fruits and all kinds of other things, it needs its trunk to be able to reach down to get food as well as water. At the end of the day, they need lots of water. And so they'll also have to use that to suck up water like a big long straw so very clever to have a long nose like that it certainly helps them it also helps them to be able to smell what's going on around and make sure that they can keep safe from lions and hyenas and all these predators that we've been talking about Jana, you're wondering how far an elephant can travel. Well, Jana, back in the day before there were lots of people on this world and there was a lot more space for the elephants, there was a time when elephants could travel all the way from South Africa in towards where Brent is in the Mara. But they didn't go quite as far as that, but they used to go up towards um, Tanzania. And so that would have been about 8,400 miles of traveling, which is a long way. Nowadays, the elephants don't move nearly as much as that. These elephants that we see here in South Africa, they can move in an area that is 8 million acres. So it gives you an idea of how big it is. It's bigger than Netherlands or Holland, and so it's bigger than a whole country, and they move around in there. And some herds will go from north to south. Some males will go from north to south, east to west. They just travel the whole area looking for food, particularly when it's this time of the year when there's lots of different plants that are flowering and and producing fruit so there's a special tree at the moment that's producing fruit and all the big elephants from the north come down and they eat here in the south and then they go back again once those fruits have stopped coming out so very clever right now elephants have wandered off there doesn't seem to be too many more left I think there's one or two just on our right hand side so we'll go and have a look at them I just need to get up towards that area right so we're gonna try and catch up with the rest of the Ellie's that are 
coming through slowly and so while I do that I'm going to send you back to Brent and those lions having their buffalo feast. Well, they are still feasting. Quite a few of them have headed off now to have a drink. So we've only got two on the carcass and one hiding in the long grass. Uh, there's, we're actually in the base of a little drainage system, so there's some puddles a little bit further to the west of us, and that's where they're heading at the moment, but the grass is very long there. We can barely see them. But so far, no hyenas around. Shana is wondering why are the lions breathing so fast or so heavily? Well, Shana, it's due to the fact that they're eating meat and uh, they gorge themselves quite often. So the digestive process causes causes them to pant heavily uh, because it causes heat. Now, they're unable to sweat like human beings do, so that's how they cool down. It's by breathing heavily and fast. So what they do is they take the air that they're breathing in, which is cooler, um, over the blood vessels in their mouth and on their tongue. That cools them down uh, and it sends cooler blood back through the rest of the body. Okay, I'm going to go see if we can see where those lines are drinking. I didn't catch the name there, Faith, but the, the question was how often do lions hunt? Now, it always... Audrina, there we go. Hello, Audrina. It all depends on... Uh, very much on uh, what they catch. So when they've caught something big like this buffalo, they're probably not going to have to hunt again for another four or so days. But uh, if they caught something small like a warthog, they'd have to hunt again probably tomorrow. Now, just for those of you who don't believe, this is 100% live coming to you from... From, from the Maasai Mara in Kenya. Uh, there the rest of the, the lions. As I said, there's a couple of little spots of water here. I don't think we're going to be able to get a view of them drinking uh, just due to the grass. But there we go. You can see there, there's a little depression there that's holding a bit of rainwater, and uh, that's where they're going to have a drink. So this is actually perfect for the lions. There's some nice big trees around um, that they can hide from the sun tomorrow under and also um, there's water right here. Actually just go back to that young male, he's looking at something, I wonder if he heard something. As I said, that, that, oh yeah, right next to us, what have we got? There's guinea fowl, that's what he heard, I heard it as well. So right in the grass next to us is a little flock of guinea, guinea fowl and this grass is so high that I had to sit up to see, you can actually just see the grass moving more than anything else. Uh, rather than actually seeing the guinea fowl, I can hear them. But just look at that, you can just see the grass moving as they move. Okay. There we go, and the lions are on the move here. Now, Yoma is wondering how fast can a lion move? Well, at their top speed, they can do about 24 meters per second, um, but they can only do that for a very short period of time. Um, and here they were going, oof, sorry? Oh, she, oh, it's got, yes, the broken tail. Um, Archie's just saying, we've seen this lioness quite a few times, so she's well known that she's got a, a, a kink in her tail. And uh, so, there we go, they're moving back. So, when they were chasing that buffalo today, they were probably doing, uh, oh, almost as fast as Usain Bolt for the majority of that time. So, they are very, very quick movers. What is that behind me? A termite mound. Oopa, there we go. So, they're heading back towards the carcass, so we're going to do the same. Now Liam is wondering how far a lion can hear prey from, um, from a, a considerable distance. But often they will only really um, go at it when it's quite close. But when it comes to hunting buffalo, not so much in the Mara, but in other parts of Africa, um, lions will hear buffalo from sometimes two or three kilometers away and then start moving towards them. Uh, so yes, they can hear prey from quite a distance away.
I'm going to be careful as there's lions lying in the grass all around here. Okay, well, let's give you one last look. One of the young males is tugging on that carcass at the moment. Uh, we're going to stay here. Uh, I'm going to be interested to see if, if any hyenas do decide to make an appearance. If not, tomorrow morning this would definitely be a very a good spot to come see. There might be some lion-hyena interaction. In the meantime, Jamie's with one of the funnier antelope in the Mara. I think topi are very entertaining and I really think that topi are so entertaining because they just look so odd. They look like they were made up of all of the other parts of the antelope put together and there's something very strange about them, especially their faces. They've got very odd faces. They look like a mixture between an antelope and a goat, I feel. So, it is a, an antelope that is very, very fast, faster than a lion at its absolute top speed, or at least as fast as a lion. And right now, we're actually in a topi breeding season, or we're getting, getting close to a topi breeding season. And what that means is that they're doing a lot of fighting at the moment. They're chasing away other male antelope and running around and all in all looking actually quite silly a lot of the time. Now at the moment, these, some of these topi are actually quite alert and they're looking off into the distance and I think that's just because they are looking towards more topi. So I think they just want to, they're looking for a fight. And in topi, even the females sometimes fight with other females over the males. Usually with most antelope, it's the other way around. Most antelope, it's the males fighting other males. But in Topi, it is the it is the males fighting the males and the females fighting the females. And in the background, I can see the biggest bird in the world. Ah! But before we do that, Lincoln Elementary would like me to. Oh, there we go. He's off. It's off. See how fast they can run. Now you didn't get the name of this particular antelope. Let me tell you what it is called. It is called a topi. T-O-P-I. Topi. So the topi is related, well, it's actually a subspecies, so it's basically the same as an antelope that occurs in South Africa that is called a tsesebi. And that's an even more complicated name because I'm going to try and spell it for you and there's a possibility, there is a distinct possibility that I'm going to get it wrong. So a tsesebi is spelled T-S-E-B-E. -E. No? Or is it B-B-E? I can't remember. I honestly cannot remember how you spell sesame. But a sesame is and a topi are basically just two of the same antelope that look different in different parts of the continent. So in South Africa, they look one way. And here in East Africa, in Kenya, the topi look completely different. They are very, very good at running, and I have absolutely no idea why they just ran. There is no reason for them to run. There is nothing scary out there. They don't seem to be fighting. They just decided they wanted to run. Very confusing. Now, sometimes we can't always explain everything that happens out here. Now, I have to tell you, I am absolutely amazed because although lions very commonly prey on buffalo, it is very unusual for a leopard to do so. And Tristan has got a young leopard who has really outdone himself this time. It is indeed, Jamie. We are being spoilt, and well, not if you're a buffalo, actually. It's a very bad day if you are a buffalo, because between the lions in Kenya and the leopards here in South Africa, they've both managed to get themselves a buffalo meal. Now, it is very unusual, like Jamie says, because buffalo are generally very, very big and very strong. And so what this leopard has done is he's managed to find himself a young buffalo. Now, this buffalo probably was only a few days old, 
and was part of the herd. And you might have found that the herd moved and this little buffalo was still kind of sitting and it wasn't really used to what was going on just yet. It didn't really know what was happening. And this leopard saw the opportunity and ran in and grabbed this little baby buffalo. And it's an incredible thing because this leopard himself is still very young. He's not an old leopard at all. He's only now just gone over two years. And so for him to catch a buffalo is very, very special indeed. So he's done incredibly well to be able to find a buffalo meal. And he's certainly going to get lots and lots of good nutrients from it. Now he's a lucky, well, not a lucky fella. He is a very good hunter already, even though he's only two years old. He's already proved himself to be an animal that can find food quite easily. Normally leopards will only be kind of go from their mother at around this age and they're still very inexperienced but because his mother left him a little bit early he was orphaned at a year old he's had to learn very quickly how to hunt and so the last year he's been practicing hunting and he's obviously managed to perfect it because he's able to bring down even big carcasses like this buffalo and you see look at him eating can you hear him crunching so every now and then he's crunching down on the bones and the reason why he's stopping and just looking is because there was an elephant that walked past in the distance so he's just watching the elephant. I'm going to try and just move us a little bit so we can get a better view and it's all very exciting. Now a leopard is one of the most special animals to see here. So I'm just going to get us one last view because I know that it's almost time for all of you to carry on with your school day. So I'm going to give you one last view of the leopard before we say goodbye to all of you. And like I say, hopefully you have enjoyed being on safari with us and that you enjoyed the lions and the buffalo and the elephants. And now, well, a leopard too. You've been very spoiled this afternoon. Not every day that this all happens so quickly. And so I hope, like I say, that you have a very good day at school and that you don't get too much homework and that you're able to have lots of fun playing during the day. But from all of us at Safari Life, it's been an absolute pleasure and we will see you guys hopefully on the next time you join us for a school safari. Right, so our school drive is now over and what a lucky drive they had this afternoon because, well, like I say, lions on a buffalo kill and a leopard on a buffalo kill is not every single day. David, you're wondering if there's any hyenas around? No, so no hyenas that we can see. Um, it's still very hot in the afternoon and I would imagine the hyenas will come in at some point during the evening. He actually killed this buffalo last night, so yesterday, late yesterday afternoon, apparently he grabbed it. The buffalo were seen crossing this road and then he came in and grabbed this little baby buffalo that was just kind of lurking around the edges, which is the most ridiculous thing because even the most brave big male leopards that I've seen struggle to hunt buffalo and it really is not an easy thing to do at all. You've obviously got a, a herd that is around that is very protective of these babies and we know that lions even struggle with buffalo hunt. So for Hosanna to get in here and grab this is just absolutely spectacular. So Sarah, no, it's not too heavy. This carcass was in the tree this morning. So he did put it up in the tree this morning. It's just that it's probably much easier for him to eat on the ground. It's also the sun on the tree to the right here. There's a big marula tree that he's using to put it up. And we've seen a number of different leopards use this tree before. But it's really quite sunny there and probably very hot. And so he's rather brought it down to feed onto the ground where it's nice and shady. And he can get in under the shade and have a really good feed. Once it starts to get dark a little bit later, you'll find that he'll pick it up and take it back up into the sort of boughs of the tree and hang it there for the night. If he doesn't though, he's going to have a lot of problems because hyenas certainly will find this during the course of the night. Now that it's been dead for a day, there's a bit of scent to it and so hyenas will smell it if he leaves it on the ground. So he's gonna to have to put it back up in the tree at some point, but for now, much more comfortable to feed on the ground like this. Interestingly enough though, Tundi was also seen not far from here during the day today. So apparently she was seen at Chitwa camp and was kind of lurking around there and then started heading up towards this direction. So I wonder if she's not going to pop out somewhere here at some stage as well. You never know, maybe we get both sort of sister and brother together in the same place. It interests me though that Tundi's all the way this side because this is the furthest we've seen her in the southeast since before she even had that cub. So she's obviously moving a lot, trying to keep Tingana's territory in check and just trying to see wherever Tingana is for her to move in that direction and hopefully keep the cub safe in those areas. So it's very, very clever from Tundi and very, very interesting to see. 
but there is still a lot of meat. Osana, the way he's going now, is probably going to be here for another two days, at least, if he's lucky. I wonder if Tingana is also going to show up on the scene at some point as well. So, Anna, you're wondering if it's his inexperience that made him risk uh, going into a buffalo herd and trying to kill a young buffalo. I suppose a little bit. Um, you know, they learn from experience, and so you probably find he hasn't done too much buffalo hunting and isn't too sure about how dangerous they can be. Also, big bull buffalo don't really often worry too much about a young male leopard. They're not going to even chase him, so he's probably walked past quite a few buffalo and hasn't had too much sort of to worry about. The other thing is also is that his experience with buffalo is limited. Remember, we haven't seen many buffalo around in the last few, well, in the last year specifically, and so... Maybe it's just more he was curious, and then when he saw the opportunity that this calf wasn't moving, he then came in. Of course, there's also the other option that this calf was already dead before he got you. I don't know if anybody actually saw him kill this calf, but there's a possibility it could have been a stillborn baby, or it could have been a situation where the baby for some reason was just not well and it died and he's then come and scavenged off it that could also be a possibility the thing is is that you never know i'll try and ask around and see if somebody did see it but if he did run into a herd and grab a calf it is seriously brazen and he's going to have to be careful because if those buffalo get hold of him they are going to do some serious damage the lucky thing about a leopard i suppose is that he's so fleet-footed that he can get up into one of these trees fairly quickly and kind of keep himself safe but it is an amazing feat to see that hosanna has managed to do this is actually very very surprising and i'm a bit shocked actually at the size of the little calf because it doesn't look like a new brand brand newborn i mean it is it's a fairly new it's probably i'd say maybe a month old but you know it's still a big meal for for a leopard to go after particularly a young male leopard of hosanna's size right now, while I sit with our young male, Hosanna, I believe Scotty has been looking for our other young male that we had this morning, Tumba, and so our two favorite young boys are out and about, and I hope that Scott's going to have some success this afternoon. Well, I also hope we're going to get lucky, but we've given up for now, and we've decided to drive off in search of any other animals, one of which was a European roller that's just flown off, well done, wildebeest who's got uh, reactions almost as fast as leopards, like Tristan was just saying with you. I wonder how Hosanna managed to snipe that buffalo. Wouldn't that have been super, super cool to witness? And I've seen it only on a few occasions, male leopards slinking in and amongst huge herds of buffalo. And a lot of the times they've actually been detected, and when they do, I've seen leopards scramble up a kind of small bush, as thin as this, to escape the buffalo, and it's kind of just like perched there with a whole herd of buffalo below it. A friend of mine, I remember, he got an incredible picture of a leopard that had made it up a dead stump, but the stump was probably two meters, just less than two meters off the ground, so not high up. The buffalo were literally right below the leopard, and it was just a sea of buffalo with this leopard perched on this little dead branch. It got lucky. It didn't get butchered. And I guess so was Hosanna. So not much fortune for the baby buffalo, but some fortune for one of our favorite young males. Now, we decided to move out of that general area where we had Tumba's tracks and move back into the area a little bit later on once it's cooled off and hopefully once Tumba's moved a little bit we're not too sure where he could have ended up. Crazy Legs, you would like to know if Hosanna would be able to hold his own against the Hukumuri male. I don't think so. I think Hosanna would get schooled by a male of Hukumuri's size and also his experience. You know we mustn't forget as impressive as Hosanna may look He's not nearly as experienced as, or big, as a, as a male like Hukumuri, who's probably twice the age, if not a little bit older than young Hosanna. I mean, another thing is, sadly, I don't know, I don't know how much uh, time any of us have really actually got to spend with male leopards when they are interacting with one another. 
And I'd be very interested to see how older males will treat younger males because they probably know that there's not too much of a threat then. Unless a young male is really stupid, uh, he's going to give way to the bigger older males and then it's going to give the bigger older males not much of a reason to get into a fight with them, I would guess. If you also think of the, the brief sighting that Noel had with uh, Gijima and Hukumori, I mean, those things weren't even close to one another. They were on opposite sides of the roads, and they're a good match for one another in terms of a showdown. Yet they are very cautious, not prone to, to physical violence, and they were just literally talking to one another by the sounds of things, vocalizing, hissing, snarling, but at a distance. So, yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to know how often male leopards come to blows and and that's with an equal match as well as the kind of yeah just a general bit more info and understanding of the, the leopards and what they do when we're not around now another question with regards to uh, leopards and fights and threats Mary would like to know if Hosanna would pose any threat to Tundi's cubs. Um, or cubs, singular. I don't think so. Um, but again, I simply haven't had enough sightings, you know, of scenarios like that. And I think each one is going to be slightly different. Um, there's nobody even who's had experience of young male leopards interacting with another leopard's cubs. Even a person who has been lucky enough to witness that maybe a handful of times in their life still wouldn't be able to categorically tell you what would happen when Hosanna came up to Tandy's Cub because each scenario is unique. And that is the beauty of being Archer. We simply don't know what's going to happen and or when. And again, I always like to try and relate all these questions back to us as a species, because if I asked you, Mary, what would happen if a man came across a single woman with a child, uh, would he be willing to marry her or not? Or, you know what I mean? I mean, there's just a million different variables judging on all of the individuals involved, the husband, the wife and the child. And the same thing is applicable out here. Very good. Well, we'll hopefully be at the Buffalzook waterhole shortly, where maybe we'll find some leopards fighting. I doubt it, though, but maybe we will get lucky. I've never seen leopards fighting in my entire career, neither boy nor girls. And while we continue on to the waterhole in hope of finding something quenching their thirst, we are going to send you off to one of the others. Well, Scotty, you're sending to the same, well, to a person in the same place as you in Juma. And hopefully, Scotty will one day see leopards fighting. It is a, an amazing thing to witness. They seriously can go at it. Obviously, I've been fortunate enough to see a couple of leopards fight in my time, which has been quite something to witness. But I wonder where little Tumba has gotten off to. He must be somewhere in that general vicinity. I'm sure Scotty will find him eventually. It's still quite hot now, so hopefully once it gets a little cooler, he'll show up somewhere. The area that Scotty's looking for him around sort of camp and to that northern side is very difficult. It's not quite as easy as what we've had it this afternoon with Hosanna lying right out in the open like this. And you can see he's finished feeding. Now he's decided time to have a bit of a rest. And I wonder if it's maybe because there were some squirrels that started alarm calling not too far from us down in the Muluwanini, which is where the last tracks of Tundi went is towards the Muluwanini drainage. So you never know. Maybe Tundi's also close by and she shows up as well. It'll be interesting to see the interaction between Hosanna and Tundi because it might be a situation where the roles are reversed. Normally it's Hosanna that kind of comes into where Tundi's got a kill and tries to pilfer from her. But this time it would be the opposite way around. And would Hosanna stand his ground a lot more? Or what would happen? It would be very, very interesting, I think, if Tundi did arrive here. And also it begs the question as to where she put her little cub if she's in this area as well. So Marcelo, are you wondering if it's true that female leopards are more prone to being violent with one another than what male leopards are? 
No, not necessarily. I think the thing is with females is that there's a couple of things that maybe make their sort of territorial disputes worse. One is if they're pregnant, then there's this feeling that they really need to protect, you know, that, well, they've got a cub coming, they need to get rid of this intruder, need to try and establish themselves and make it a, a danger-free zone. The other is if they've already got cubs, then they know that other females are potentially a threat to them, and so they'll then push them out to try and keep those cubs safe, and that makes them a lot more aggressive than maybe what the males would be. The males also know full well that a fight with another male can... In, basically render them useless and, and killed or dead or a loss of territory so they'll do everything they can to avoid that fight whereas if a female feels like I've got no choice I've got cubs and I've got to protect this area then she's far more prone to actually engaging and be getting physical with another female than what a male is but it's not to say either one of them won't fight so I mean I've seen males females all of them go after one another and so you know it's it's a situation where it just depends on the circumstances more than the actual sex of the individual but I, I've seen more females Males come to blows than I have males. Males typically just trot alongside each other and growl and hiss and vocalize and salivate and that's normally enough to kind of settle what's going on but you know every now and then you will find the males come to blows as well and if you have a chance and you want to see how hectic the males fights can be there's some videos floating around somewhere of Mafufunyan and Tyson fighting on Arethusa a few years ago and that was just absolutely something they went after each other and it went on for hours and they really kind of abused each other quite badly so it shows you just how aggressive males can be as well now Robert you're wondering how heavy is Hosanna and compared to other males Robert I have no idea I've never picked him up and so I wouldn't know and I certainly haven't picked up any other leopards that are his age so very difficult to say how much he weighs we were discussing this the other day it's you know we we'd throw out these rough estimates but we actually have absolutely no idea and it would be nice VM and I were talking about trying to build some sort of contraption that leopards could walk over that could give us their weight but obviously that's not the case and so we don't really know what I will tell you is that Hosanna I mean he's a he's a big boy for his age he's a two-year-old male he's quite thick set quite big he's got a little bit of a dewlap growing he's a stocky leopard so he's probably he's quite heavy um, I would say he if I had to guess that he's probably weighing at about maybe 60 kilograms which would be heavier than any of the females here but still sort of 20 30 kilograms short of the big males like Anderson so he's still got a bit of a way to go he might be a little bit more than that after a buffalo meal like this he might go a little bit more but that's where I think he would be roughly interestingly enough this morning when I saw Tamba I was kind of thinking that Tamba looks so much smaller than Hosanna but now that I see Hosanna this afternoon Tamba is actually not that far off Tamba just hasn't got that squareness in the shoulders just yet but he will get there in terms of the actual body size they're both quite similar and now that I've seen both together within a short space of time Tamba is actually not doing too badly at all Right, well, while I kind of watch Hosanna get himself nice and clean and get little bits of buffalo off him, let's send you back across to Scotty, who's got an animal that probably has the best idea in terms of dealing with the heat this afternoon. It certainly does, and we are here at the Buffalsook waterhole. We found ourselves a shady spot, and we won't be quite as cool as this hippo, but to be honest, I would not like to go into this water. There's been a bit of an algae bloom. And it's this kind of spooky, greeny, brown color. And it's filled with elephant poop and buffalo poop and all manner of poop. So even though it would be refreshingly cool, it wouldn't be a refreshing smell. That is for certain not very inviting. Not like the crystal clear waters of Lake Tanganyika in Tanzania, one of the most magical places I've ever been to in Africa. Check out the Mahali Mountains National Park if you'd like to see a unique and beautiful park in Africa. Where you can see chimpanzees. Here's a little blacksmith lapwing doing some preening just like Tamba. I mean, Hosanna, not Tamba. Tamba could also be preening, we just don't know where he is. Kathy, you'd like to know if hippos could get sick from water being too filthy or rancid. I guess, yes, if, you know, a hippo was wounded and old and sick, maybe it would kind of give in to dirty water. However, they are very, very tough animals, and I have seen hippos 
in kind of drought conditions where they are packed side by side, sometimes even crocodiles walking on top of them. There's really not even close to enough water for all the water-dwelling animals. And they still survive. And, I mean, that must be filthy, filthy water because there will be a lot of animals defecating in it. And I guess it just becomes very concentrated when there's not much other water around. So, no, I don't think they're going to have a problem. And when you consider that most of the animals actually drink this, not just bathe in it, they drink it, um, it gives you a good idea of how tough their stomachs are compared to ours. Now, VM was hoping to have some challenges with regards to filming birds bathing, but I think we've come a little bit early. It's not bath time yet. Robert, you'd like to know if this is the same species of hippo found in the mire. Yes, it is. There's only one large uh, species of a hippopotamus here in Africa, but you also do get pygmy hippos. So that's the only other species of hippo I know of. I've never seen one. And they're tiny. I'm guessing probably maybe 100 or 200 kilograms as opposed to two or three tons. And you find those in the central African rainforest. So I also realize that you get an a manatee in Africa, which is also a pygmy. It's not nearly, a, and it's a freshwater manatee. Um, bizarre. So that's also a recent uh, development that I learned about. It's also in Central Africa, in and around the rivers and rainforests there. Speaking of that, wouldn't it be nice if we went to the Congo? Whew! Those guys look like they had an incredible recce trip there. And if you haven't seen the trip, you should definitely check it out because Brent, Graham, Jandre, and Peter, four of our team members, including our boss, um, went into the Congo and did a bit of a recce with the possibility of us setting up shop over there. Very good. Again, I don't have a clue who I'm linking to. My brain is frazzled just as well. I am going on leave tomorrow, but I'm sad to be leaving here. I might be back, though. Who knows what will happen? Um, but it is time for me to head off for a break, and it's time for you to head off to another vehicle. Well, Scotty, best you get that brain sorted. Still another couple drives to go, and then you'll be on leave, and everything will be all good. But we are still sitting with Hosani. He's now gone back to his carcass and started to feed. And you can see, for those of you that are a bit sensitive, probably best to turn away now because he's a bit kind of gruesome with what's going on. Is he's tucking into the nose now it's a place that a lot of the cats do feed off quite early on in the carcass they like that soft nose area and on a buffalo of this size which is actually a lot smaller than i first thought now that we've kind of come around and we can see it's sort of back end area and that skull will still be very soft it's not going to be nearly as hard as an older buffalo and so he can still crunch through and get that soft nasal area and then even into the tongue and and then around through even potentially into the brain casing so it's a a situation where cats feed off at lots and it, like I say it is a little macabre sometimes but it's the way nature is and then at the end of the day the animal is no longer alive and so you know it's it's not feeling it but I, I know it's a little bit much for some people so like I say if you don't like seeing the kind of kiss of death then you're welcome to look away right so now from one macabre scene to another I'm going to send you back to Brent Leo Smith who's got lines I would imagine doing something very similar as they devour a buffalo in the Mara. There you go, you can see the massive flies that have just landed on this buffalo already. Remember this is coming to you 100% live from the Maasai Mara in Kenya. The whole pride is now feeding. There we go, you can see them getting through the sinew there. And being such a small pride and with such a big meal, there isn't the normal aggression you get around the carcasses. So quite a peaceful meal for a lion meal. Normally it's all snarls, growls and swats. Remember if you have any questions, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, um, or just on whatever feed you might be watching on, whether it be YouTube or Facebook, wherever, just pop a question in the feed below.
I don't think I'm going to spend too much more time here. Right, let's see what else we can find as we meander uh, back towards the top of the mountain because we do have to get going uh, to make the park times. So we're going to leave these lines shortly. But I'm sure Jamie will be here tomorrow morning to see exactly what has happened uh, overnight. And as I said, there's, there is a, a large hyena population in this area. So there is a good chance that the hyenas might move in overnight. They would have heard these, the buffalo distress calls uh, earlier when the buffalo were taking it down. But it sounds like it has been a cat-filled afternoon. Lots of lions in the Mara, leopard in South Africa. So let's go see which lions Jamie's got. I have got the Olololo Pride, who are true to their name, right next to Olololo Gate, which is one of the entrances to the Mara Triangle. And, you know, I think they're actually hunting buffalo, or at least they're getting prepared to hunt buffalo. They're using these croton-covered drainage, uh, drainage lines, what am I talking about? Termite mounds where they've probably spent most of the afternoon. But if we look a little bit to the right across into the setting sun and the dust, over there is a buffalo herd. So I can't, it's amazing how our, I guess you could call it a narrative, the drive narrative, um, or at least the way that things have panned out because you can't really ne necessarily ascribe a narrative to a wild situation. But it's interesting that the topic of conversation today seems to be buffalo under pressure. Whether it's been a Brent's lion hunt, the buffalo chasing the male lion, Hassana eating a baby buffalo, which I'm still astounded by, and now the Olololos in close proximity to a buffalo herd. I don't think they're going to hunt before the end of this afternoon's safari. I think they're going to wait until the cover of night. I'm just wondering if this car can get past me. Sorry, hold on a sec. Have you got enough space? Um, Sandy, you want to know if lions will share kills with any other animals? Um, Sandy, the answer is no, not if they can help it. There are occasionally sites of lions eating on one side of the carcass and a, li and a hyena eating on the other, and those situations are very rare because most of the time the lions really do not appreciate the competition. But other than that, they will not share their kills with any other predator. They might accidentally lose half of it to a hyena that then runs off, and they might lose a mouthful or two to a jackal that might be after, for example, hey guys, we're in a terrible spot. We're in a good spot to see the lions, but we're in a terrible spot. I'm blocking everybody's route. Okay, I'm going to move away. Unfortunately, this was as close as the lines, to the lines as we could get. Anyway, what we're going to do is send you across to a leopard who has been very successful and a poor buffalo who absolutely did not strike it lucky this time. Well, as you can see, Osana has now dragged his little buffalo out a little bit further and is absolutely tucking into it. He's really having a full go. He's turned it around so he's not eating the head anymore. He's now got started to tuck into a rib area and slowly but surely he's just devouring this at a rate of knots. There isn't actually that much meat left there for him. He's eaten quite a lot of it. It's kind of hollowed out that skin area and it's mostly just legs now and ribs. There's a little bit of meat over the sort of top of the back but other than that he's actually eaten quite a bit already and I'm not surprised given that he did kill this yesterday afternoon so I was I believe the guys saw the buffalo and then they saw him with this carcass so no one actually saw him bring it down which means that it could th theoretically have been you know like I say an injured young one or a stillborn or something like that it's, I mean, it's difficult to say without actually seeing what happened when without it being here at the time but isn't it just incredible to see a leopard feeding off a buffalo it's not every day you get to see this at all and in fact in my time as a guide in the Sabi Sands I think this is probably maybe only I'd say maybe the fifth or sixth time that I've seen leopard on a buffalo kill, so it's very, very uncommon. So Nancy, wondering if Osana would share the kill with Tingana. Uh, 
I suppose reluctantly he would have to because Tingana being a little bigger than him would probably bully him off this kill and take most of it and eat it. So, he, I mean, I don't think he'd want to share it with him, but he'd in, inevitably probably end up yielding to Tingana and, and allowing Tingana to feed off it. And Tingana would eat all of this very quickly. Tingana is a bit of a glutton and he can kind of chomp down. And so it might actually not be not the worst thing. You know, Hosanna is hunting just fine at the moment and Tingana, who's seemingly not himself, might not be the worst thing for him to kind of come in here and just get some nice nutrients without having to spend too much energy so it wouldn't be that bad hopefully Tingana is not too far then and he comes in and just kind of can feed a little bit I know it's, it sounds odd but you know Hassan has proved himself as a capable hunter and keeps finding food I think it would be much easier for him to find food than it is for Tingana at the moment so it's almost, it almost seems better and, and a more worthwhile situation to have Tingana come in and kind of pull for this carcass and get some nutrients that he obviously needs because he certainly still isn't himself and, and he hasn't kind of surfaced on Juma as yet and Hukumuri is just walking around and sort of marked at the moment and it's a bit concerning because it's obviously going to lead to a very different looking Juma in terms of our dynamics come these winter months that we're going into fairly shortly. But how cool is that? Like I say, this is not something that you see every single day. It's absolutely astounding to watch Hosanna kind of digging into a buffalo. It just seems so odd. Now, it's obviously, I mean, there's a male impalas are probably bigger, but it's still just the risk involved with all of this. Peter, you want to know how long Hosanna is from nose to tail? Well, he's approximately 6 feet 2 inches and a few centimeters. We measured him the other day. And uh, no, I'm joking, Peter. I have absolutely no idea how long he is. He's a wild animal, so we don't have the ability to measure wild animals. Um, we don't dart them and kind of try and go after them. And so, difficult to say. But what I will tell you is that he's probably in the region, you know, generally you'll find a situation with leopards from sort of tip of the tail to the nose can be about two and a half to three meters so I would say he's probably at about oof, just over two and a half I mean, so probably about two and a half is what I would guess I mean that's a complete random guess their tails are quite long but difficult to say I mean we we don't have a the ability to measure them and I certainly am not going to get out and go and tell Hosan just to sit still while I put a nose a tape from his nose to his tail How oh, those eyes, he's got such penetrating eyes as well. We're so lucky our two young boys both have amazing eye colors. So, Darkstar, you're wondering if he's going to eat bones as well? Well, he'll eat the bones that he's able to crunch down. So that you can see if you look at the rib section, just to the left of his face there, and there you can see he's broken some of those rib bones and eaten some of those already. And those would have been soft enough and, and pliable enough for him to actually eat. When it comes to like the scapulars, the skull, uh, the spine, you'll probably find that his jaws are just not strong enough to be able to do that just yet. And so he's probably going to have to leave that and the hyenas will clean that up. If this was a male lion on, on this buffalo, you'll find this male, a male lion would probably just eat all the way through that, crunch every little bone, kind of clean it all up. Whereas with this guy, you know, he's bones his jaw structure is just not strong enough to be able to go through all of the bones but he certainly will eat the softer bones you'll find he'll probably eat a bit of the hooves a bit of the sort of the lower leg bones where they're still quite sort of thin and soft he'll try as much as he can though that's for sure if he, if he can crunch down the bone he certainly will at the end of the day it's nutrients that he can get out of it very cool though well done, Hosanna. It's a very good job you've done here. It's certainly taken to life so well. I know we've been saying it often, but you know, at a year at a year ago, it was uncertain as to what his future would hold, and yet here we are, sitting a year later with a buffalo kill and Hosanna. It's pretty ridiculous. Deadhead Tommy, wondering about what I think with Tingana and Mvula and whether or not they're going to become or a situation where you know Tingana is going to be very similar to Mvula and become a nomadic male, possible. It depends on what's actually going on with Tingana. I don't really know. I haven't personally seen him since all of this sort of drama has been folding out. So I don't know what he looks like. I've seen pictures of him and he seems to look okay, except that he's lost a bit of condition around his chest area. And he's not quite as bulky as he used to be, but 
I, it's possible. There's so many other males here that it wouldn't be a surprise me in any way whatsoever if he became this male that became nomadic, much like Mvula did. It's a situation where, at the end of the day, you know, he's going to try and move as much as he can and try and get away as much as he can from a lot of these sort of males if he's not 100%. But I tell you one thing, his his ability to survive and his instinct to survive will far outweigh his kind of want for dominance so if he feels like he can't fight he then will become nomadic and just try and survive more than anything else you never know maybe he bounces away gets kind of fit again and can take a different territory or something like that so you know it's not the end of the road for Tingana even if he is pushed out he can still try and kind of find a way but I don't know I think we're far away from that just yet I think Tingana is still around he's still kind of moving yeah there seems to be some semblance of him kind of scent marking around and following you know Tandi and, and looking after the Cubs so I think there's still some fight left in Tingana I don't think we should be writing him off in any way whatsoever yet I think it's still a long way to go until he's kind of considered out of the game right now while Hosanna devours on the skull of this buffalo, which is going to be quite gruesome, let's send you back across to Jamie, who I believe is just taking a nice meander through the Mara. I'm taking a lovely meander through the Mara. It has been a rather gruesome Valentine's Day, is it not? Very gruesome Valentine's Day drive. Oh well, it's just one of those things. Happy Valentine's for the animals that managed to get their meals. So the first thing we're going to do tomorrow morning on the Sunrise Safari is come back and check on the Olololo Pride because I'm, I'm pretty certain they're going to hunt those buffalo and I'm pretty certain they're going to wait until the fall of night to do so. Again, it's a situation where it's not lone buffalo, it's an entire herd. So I think they'll wait until darkness gives them cover. Suity chat over there since it's nice and close and I've got nothing else. Here we go. And then if we go to the right, we've got the much more distinctive male. There we go. With the white window bars. A sooty chat. And we see them on this road pretty much every single day. I'm sorry, Faith, I missed that. Any what on our Mara Cheetah? Sorry. Oh, um, no, unfortunately not, Nate. I, I haven't heard much apart from I saw that there was a... Uh, an update from Sky Doogie, also known as Lisa, who is one of our regular viewers, and she said that she'd been with the Fast Five, all the Musketeers, and that they had been scrapping a little bit. Uh, Malaika was in the Conservancy last I heard, and she was doing pretty well for herself. She'd managed to catch a warthog and something else as well, somewhere down the line. Um, other than that, no, I haven't heard any other updates on any of the cheetah. We haven't gone across the river for the last few days just because we spent such an extended period of time over there during the course of our TV show. I need to move. I'm sorry. People on their way home. There we go. How are you doing? Good, thank you. Good thanks. Yeah, watching you on TV in a few weeks. Awesome. <laughs> They'll be watching us on TV in a few weeks. <laughs> right, we're going to continue. Well, I'm going to try and remember how to drive first, and then I'm going to continue on our adventure. Now, we're going to send you across back to Scott Dyson to see what adventures he has in store for you. Thank you, Jamie, and thank you very much for your performance late yesterday afternoon when you narrated Brent driving up the hill. It was something absolutely beautiful. Worth looking for if you didn't get to see it. It was hilarious. Brent fancies himself as the best driver, not just amongst our Safari Live crew, but in the world, out of all the drivers. So, <laughs> she, she just played along with that yesterday, and it was quite superb, I found. So, 
This morning we had a young male leopard. He was about half a mile off to our right and we went out and spent a little bit of time with him after our sunrise safari to show some of the crew members who don't get out as much as we are lucky enough to. And he was last seen heading kind of north not really towards this road though, more kind of in that direction off to our right. However, when we came up into this area this afternoon, I was going to drive off down to our right behind us there. But I didn't have the opportunity to because we found some of his tracks crossing the road right over here. Oh, I didn't do a very good job parking. Let me try again. Oh, there you can see one. Not very easily though, but that is a leopard track coming towards us. And he just crossed the road over here. Straight across. He possibly continued up onto Termite Mound, which is just a little bit off to the left below that power line pole. And thereafter we are not too sure where he has headed. So. There is a small water hole in that direction, maybe he headed off there for a drink, didn't see any sign of him going there, but it's difficult to always see footprints and he doesn't necessarily always stick to the roads as these last tracks clearly indicated, he just crossed straight over. We're actually lucky to find those tracks in the first place, otherwise I would have been off searching in the completely wrong direction. But we've got an idea, he's somewhere here. Maybe he's already moved quite far, maybe he hasn't. So, we'll just lurk around you and maybe get lucky with some alarm calls and maybe he'll just poke his head out at the right time. Now, I'm sorry, I didn't get your name very clearly. It sounded like Juma something. Juma fan. And I'm glad you're a fan of Juma. Now, you'd like to know if I ever met the Mapojo coalition of male lions and I did indeed. They were the first coalition of lions that I ever actually got to spend time with. It was when I started my career in 2008 I think as a guide um, and they had just started coming into the area where I was work working which is southwest of here kind of around Londolozi, Singita and surroundings. Um, they were a coalition of five males and just like most large coalitions of that size they caused complete chaos and confusion when they came in. Spent a lot of time together once they established themselves which was in the first few months that I was there and over the next three years they began to spend less and less time with one another and after having spent three years, just longer I think in that area, three and a half years, I moved away and shortly after I moved away they were killed by the, what was the next coalition? Was it the Majingilans? Huh? The yeah, it was the Majingis after the Mapojos. So, yeah, one of, well not all of them were killed in one sitting, but I know one of them was killed in an area around a lodge called Savannah, very nice lodge. Wildebeest has spotted some tracks. Let me jump off quickly. Wildebeest is very, very useful when it comes to finding tracks. Definitely one of the best cameramen at tracking. The tricky thing here is there's so many baboons and monkeys that have moved through this area and the, the fingers of a baboon can look a lot like the kind of toes of a leopard. Okay, nothing up here, but, but let me check behind you somewhere. Ooh, well done, VM. VM has found the leopard tracks. And what's interesting is that they are heading in this opposite direction to where I would have expected them to be. They're definitely male leopard tracks, so that's who we're looking for. Well done, Vim. Maybe he went for a drink and he's come back here. What's further interesting is we drove this road not too long ago. Now, it's not to say that our tire tracks would have, sorry, <laughs> it's not to say that our tire tracks, which are only about this wide, didn't miss the tracks. 
but it may mean that he's been slinking around be be right beneath us here. Hmm. Where are you? Are you watching us, Tumba? Are you in a thicket right here? Okay, well. Sorry, I'm just keeping quiet so I can listen. Difficult to yabber onto you permanently whilst in a situation like this. Where did the tracks come from, though, VM? That's what I'm trying to work out. Because why did I not see any here? Okay, guys. Um, as you've gathered, I need to spend some time here figuring out where he's come from and where he's going to. And while I continue to investigate that, we shall send you across to Brent Leo Smith, who is probably going to say goodbye on behalf of him and the Myra crew. We'll see you shortly, hopefully, with some good news. Well, uh, hopefully Scotty's news is great and it has been an amazing afternoon here in the Mara. So from myself, Archie, Jamie, Adrian, Faith and Alice and all our incredible tech team. Uh, whoa, we had a... Ah, uh, I don't know, what? Jamie and everyone have been... Ah, <laughs> oh, very sweet. I did not know that was there. <laughs> They've been sneak. I was wondering what Archie was doing, pointing at the roof. <laughs> very clever. Very, very clever. Now, I'm taking this as everyone has been involved in this. Yeah, I can see Jamie actually laughing at us. Uh, but anyway, well, happy Valentine's Day to everybody. And what an amazing afternoon it has been. Uh, and we're going to send you all the way back to South Africa. And hopefully Tristan 